You are listening to the Fan to Fan Podcast, and on this episode, we're talking about 1978 horror classic John Carpenter's Halloween. Here we go. And then for the next uh, four hours, we'll Josh will just have you read your thesis and that's do right, like, <laughs> like an audio thesis. That's right, because we're we're coming in hot on the Fan to Fan podcast, which is what folks are listening and to. Fan after dark. That's right. That's right. Up all night. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm Bernie Gonzalez, one of your hosts. Pete Charbonneau, also here with our returning guest, Joshua Pruitt, Emmy winning. TV writer and author who's worked on Mystery Science Theater 3000, Phineas and Ferb, Last Comics on Earth. We've talked with Josh about, dear Lord, Josh, I think pretty much everything under heaven and in between, maybe a few things under, because we all share, uh, turns out we share, we have a, a lot of shared interest in movies and TV and comics, video games, all of the above, all of the above. And there's something we, we keep coming back to, guys, kind of over and over again. There, There is, yeah, yeah. There's times where that's like the uh, the subtitle for this one. Yes. <laughs> I, I feel like Josh is, uh, he's like an honorary co-host at this point, Bernie. Oh, oh hands down. down. I was like, no, I, don't know down. The, I don't know the guest is appropriate. It's almost giving me too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, something like proxy marauding host. Fancy marauding Ooh. co-host. Ironically enough, though, it may be the one thing you don't put on your IMDb, Josh. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. You guys are my secret girlfriend. There we go. Um, here's the transition. One thing that we have not kept secret is our love for John Carpenter. Anytime the three of us are together, you can't play a drinking game that involves us mentioning Carpenter because you will be drunk. We... uh celebrate his entire catalog and we've devoted months to talking about his filmography because i feel like that's john carpenter he's the gift that keeps on giving he's like the jelly bean of the month if you're looking at a, a christmas vacation a hundred percent and so this is a great kickoff to our six hour analysis of of the first 10 minutes of halloween just the first 10 minutes just Absolutely. the first 10 minutes that's what we're yes. breaking down yeah, that's right. Uh, Carpenter is such a big part of my life. He just posted the other day. I just wanted to share this thing that I thought was so cool. He says on his Twitter at the Horror Master that his dad, Howard Carpenter, played violin on Brenda Lee's Jingle Bell Rock. Wow. His dad was a member of the Nashville String. So a little bit of Carpenter trivia provided by the gentleman himself. That's to right. Kind of kick off our chat today that's right and connecting the dots with the holidays thank you josh that was nice yeah, look <laughs> it at all that. was strong together yeah so it makes sense stuff airs in 2024 <laughs> that's right if, <laughs> it'll be right after the holidays very <laughs> apropos so well, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about you know a movie that really has not as i probably not really gotten a whole lot of film analysis over the years so <laughs> but, um you know we're, we're going to be breaking all sorts of ground here i'm glad you brought that up pete because uh halloween has not been talked about enough. Halloween. Newsweek magazine calls it a superb exercise in the art of suspense, the most frightening flick in years. Halloween. The Chicago Sun-Times says it's so scary, I would compare it to Psycho. It's the kind of picture, says the Chicago Tribune, that forces you to sleep with the lights on. A masterpiece, says New York's New Times. Halloween. From Compass International, rated R. It's been out since 1978, and you think a few people would devote a little bit of time to, to talk think. about this movie. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that we're, we're taking up the torch. Underappreciated. Underappreciated. It is uh, my birthday movie, so it came out the same year I was born. So I get to be the same age as my favorite movie of all time, which is great. Super into that. I was also born in 78, so Josh, hey, we would right. be, we could share the cake. We can and yes. on the other side of the cake is uh, Romero's Dawn of the Dead, which is also 78. Oh, that's right. That's right. Which I didn't th I didn't actually realize until uh, earlier this year. So, And we I could guess. invite Pete over because he has the two VHS uh, release of that. So oh, we could nice. watch that. What <laughs> cover is that, Pete? It's the shot of, um, it's like the very like um, like sun-drenched yes. like, yes. box oh. cover. And it's got Roger like slowly. Oh, yes. Classic. I, and, you know, it's funny. I still remember, or now that we're off, off on a complete tangent, right? um, I, I hey, remember the podcast. Some, some kind of catalog. I was in my dining room and I saw it amongst like, it was like just like a random catalog of stuff. I don't even remember what company it was, but I saw like the VHS box for it. I want to say it was like 20 bucks. I'm like, 
wow, even I've got $20 on me. So I somehow ordered it. I mean, this was like my cousin and I's favorite movie for, for ages. Still is. Oh, nice, so, nice, nice, nice. You know, I, I don't remember what year I got it, but I still have it. It's like packed away somewhere right now. But uh, I do have a VCR. So one day that that might be a, that might be a fun thing to revisit, to pop it in the old VCR. And- 1978 VHS double feature. That's right. But in the meantime, they'll have to in meantime, to talk about Halloween, which yeah, came out in 1978. Hope- and uh, I wanted to just give a little bit of context because, you know, I like Bernie this. Context Gonzalez. That is literally my <laughs> middle name. Yes. We're talking about this movie for one very specific reason, because I'm sure there are, as we've kind of mentioned already, countless podcasts that have had examined Halloween from a number of different perspectives. But I, I always think it's always important to at least contextualize how important this movie is, because it really is the template for slashers. I mean, horror is a a very deep genre, a lot of different perspectives. But when you think about Halloween and you think about what John Carpenter and Deborah Hill were able to put on the screen and you think about what came before, because if you've listened to any episode, I always like to think what came out that year when that movie was released, because one, Pete was probably at the theater at the box office getting tickets for that movie, especially if it was missing in action two and or three. And why why was something like John Carpenter's The Thing overlooked when it was released? And then mm-hmm. you look at what came out that year and it tells a story. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of hearing those stories. So 1978, Halloween comes out. What comes out before that? Arguably, Black Christmas always kind of gets put in the conversation because that's 1974. Black Christmas. There was a little girl murdered over in the park tonight. Yes, I heard. A high school girl's been murdered. Mr. Harrison's daughter is missing. And now at the house where she lives, the other girls are getting obscene phone calls. Hello? (laughs) What are you doing? Remember those idyllic scenes out of your childhood? Crisp winter nights, sleigh bells, crackling yule logs. Remember those. Remember them well. After Black Christmas, they'll never be the same again. Black Christmas, starring Olivia Hussey, Keir Jolet, Margot Kidder, and starring John Saxon as Lieutenant Fuller. If this movie doesn't make your skin crawl, it's on too tight. So some could say, is that the first slasher? I could see that. A lot of the tropes that we see in Halloween, some are represented in Black Christmas, some are not. Mm -hmm. Certainly seems like an inspiration for Carpenter, and I think I've heard him say as much. If we look before that, you look at Giallo films from Italy, you look at Hitchcock's Psycho, that was 1960. This is Alfred Hitchcock asking you not to tell your friends too much about Psycho. After all, you want them to suffer the same shock and terror that you did. So help them by keeping them in the dark. Of course, it's all right to talk about Psycho. You may even go Psycho if you wish. But please don't give away our ending. It's the only one we have. Halloween has the DNA of all of these things and that inspired the golden age of slashers that we've enjoyed with Friday the 13th, My Buddy Valentine, Prom Night, all of those movies that we grew up with that we saw at the VHS store. Those movies made such a big impact on us. Halloween made a big impact on the people who made those movies. The perspective, I think, that we're coming in with is that you probably already know all of this. Wikipedia shared all of this stuff with you. Someone on YouTube did a really good analysis of it. Really, we're here to hear hear Josh's perspective because this guy wrote his thesis about the movie. Yeah, my master's thesis, yeah. One of the first things when we first met you, because fell into each other's orbit because of Mystery Science Theater 3000, your participation in the production of that, our shared love for it. And then we're like, what else has this guy done? And you're like, oh, also, by the way, throwaway comment. I wrote my master's thesis on Halloween. We like the cut of this guy's jib. We didn't <laughs> want to talk about that at one point. And I think this is now two years plus later. Maybe? Yeah, probably. Yeah, and yeah. we're finally getting around to it. So, Josh, uh, why did you write your master's thesis on Halloween? Great question. Um, so, yeah, so I was an illustration uh, master's at Cal State Fullerton. And uh, I was on my way to trying to find work. Um, as a part of your uh, degree, you have to do a gallery show. So I did an original, I did concept design and storyboards for an original horror movie pitch. And then the other piece of that is that you have to do a 30 page plus paper. 
And I was like, man, what the, what am I going to write about? What am I going to write 30 pages on? And I was like, oh, what if I did a Halloween, but I did it through an artistic perspective, what they were doing, you know, visually. So the paper actually started out, I think my first line was something like horror is cinema's bastard and just to get people's attention. And, you know, because I was going to be sharing this with a number of art students and faculty at the time, I, I definitely spent quite a few pages giving some historical context, you know, Bernie style, um, just so people understood w what the tradition, the Halloween kind of came out of. But where I spent most of my time was on the design of the movie. So the idea of, I think, first and foremost, like Bernie said, it's like, you know, people have talked about the origins of this all the time. I think what's interesting about it is to kick it off, you've got Carpenter coming off of first Dark Star, goofy guys in space, whole, you know, Western adjacent, which is Carpenter's real milieu. Is He's a Western guy. And then Assault on Precinct 13, which is Rio Bravo meets Night Living Dead. And so him coming at the Babysitter Murders project that became Halloween, he has a totally different eye for what this is going to be. Talking about Black Christmas from Bob Clark is really great, gives context, but that's largely a thriller. And I think a lot of people make so, uh, make that distinction. It depends on who you talk to. So like when you're talking about the origins of the slasher, right? So it's like people can really get into the uh, minutia of that. But that movie is really closer to what we understand a thriller. And the slasher piece of this, I think, is where you could make an argument where this is a largely bloodless movie in its own way, as much as it's credited as being the first slasher. It's also largely a thriller. The suspense is the point, right? The punctuation points are in here, but they're, you know, they're lowercase, right? They re they hit with emotional impact, but it's not about the violence. Not in this one anyway, not in the first film. But what drew me to it was like, I was just surprised at the, the frame of this thing. How did they put this thing together visually? And one of the first things that struck me, which I didn't know until I had already like, been super into the movie is that in the script they don't call him michael they call him in the shape and that's the thing that kind of led me on this path where i went what what is that why would you do that i wasn't in this horror films until john carpenter came to me with this film and and he said i have a film and uh, low budget and he said three hundred thousand dollars I said, $300,000? He said, well, yeah. And I said, what's the story about? He said, it's a, about a babysitter to be killed by the boogeyman. The word babysitter clicked with me because every kid in America knows what a babysitter is. We went to a list of scares. You know, like imagine if, you know, you're in bed with your boyfriend and he goes down to get some water or coke or something and comes back with a sheet trying to pretend he's a ghost. But it's not him. It's all these kinds of things that we wrote down, all these scares. And then we decided to weave the scares into the story. Basically, it was a complete 50-50 collaboration. I wrote the first draft laying in the kids, the teenagers, the teenage talk, the girl talk amongst each other. And John came back with a pass for the Sam Loomis character, which was played by Donald Pleasance. So all the stuff about evil and everything is really John's. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. One of the things that's the most significant about the success of this movie is that you're dealing with an abstract source of evil. So in the years since, lots of other filmmakers have remade and revisited, and we've had sequels from Carpenter that he's not even sure he wanted to be involved in, most of which I love anyway. But there's this notion that like his motivation is irrelevant and he's not really a person. And so you've got the filmmakers. That's just not part of the text. That's part of actually how he's being treated visually. So that was like my entry was like, that's weird. Why are they calling him the shape? And then it was, oh, wait, no, that's also how they're treating him. They're treating him like an abstract shape inside the frame. And so you've got Carpenter's eye. He's got this widescreen eye working in collaboration with Dean Cundy. This is something else. This is not the guy stalking people in the house. This is an abstract entity 
that's supposed to terrify us. We're all afraid of the same things. We're all born afraid of, of death, of loss of loved ones, loss of, of, of abandonment from our parents, pain, injury, all of it is the same. We're all afraid of the same things, which makes a movie that deals in our fears uh, universal. And when you break down that element, that's wild. That is a totally different intention for a horror movie like this. And granted, you know, Carpenter, again, this is like his third movie. He's 30 years old. He's literally like the oldest guy on set, right? He's the old man that everybody's like, oh, wow, like he's so experienced. They'll, like, you know, I, I, I'm often imagining what that would be like. Like some, some, someday someone's going to make a movie about the making of that movie. Like a draw, you know, a fun like dramatization of like what that was like, a bunch of kids getting together and making this movie. But that's really where it kicked off. It came from me looking at the script and realizing, oh, he's called the shape the whole time. What is that about? And then answering that question for the next 20 pages. I remember, I'm sure it was probably the first or second time that I saw it um, when the credits roll and he's listed as the shape in the credits. Right. And even that, you know, at the young age that I was when I first saw it, I was probably like 12 or 13. There's just like a coolness factor to that. Like, I, you know, the, what what you describe as as like the the, you know, the undercurrents and like these elements of like the faceless entity probably got on a very primal level. But like the thing to me that jumped out in the credits, so like that's just like really cool and not something that I had ever seen before. Like that you mm -hmm. would refer to someone that you know as the shape because now it, it's like this otherworldly thing. It, it it immediately for me added all this extra mythos and intrigue on top of a, a movie that I had just seen was already like, wow, this is amazing. And then it just like amplified it by to the X factor just because of that credit listing. What I thought about doing was not giving the antagonist, Michael Myers, really much of a backstory, but kind of kicking him up into a I don't know, legendary kind of, of situation where he's much more like an element of nature. Because I thought that would be more frightening rather than personifying make him almost a force. So then the mask, which ties in with Halloween, would blank out his human features for most of the film, making him then uh, just some, some sort of force of evil that is uh, irrational, unstoppable. There's something interesting about that that you brought up, Josh, because when I think about what the Halloween franchise, like you were alluding to, becomes, and to be fair, it's actually what almost every other slasher yes. franchise becomes where it has to be bigger the gore that is absent in halloween they make up for with every subsequent sequel right mm -hmm. and it becomes in some in some versions cartoony to its detriment it leans into it like in leprechaun or Fright, uh, nightmare on elm street where they're like hey this is who this character evolves into but not what it started as yes. and there's something about the shape whether it was intentional or not how making a character addressing what evil is or could be, but without any guardrails, mm -mm. because you're not intending to do a sequel. You're saying everything you want to say in the first one for $320K over 20 days. And it's not until it makes a shit ton of money that now you're being told by producers, you're going to have to revisit this. There has to be more, but now you're adding guardrails. What mythology did we set up that we now have to live by because it's canon? Now yeah. we have to do these things. And then the shape starts taking form. That magic is in that first one, probably before it was shown to the, the second audience. You don't know what this is. And we kind of made it with that intention, too, that we're not meant to know what this is. Mm -hmm. But then as people walk out, they're like, well, you're going to have to tell us what this is. It's like, no, that's where the magic stopped. Well, where's this history? Does he kill more? What happens to Lori? What about Loomis? It's like, no, no, no. If you just walked away after the first one, he's the shape. He never becomes the Michael Myers that McFarlane releases a hundred figures of or that people buy PJs of. Nope. Yeah. Never happens. No, he is. And that's the thing is the mystique is like the, the strength. And I think the real home run about the movie is that because all the tension and suspense are so successful, because his collaboration with Deborah Hill in the creation of those girls and how well-rounded they are and how relatable they are. I always remember uh, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill seemed always, you know, very preoccupied with getting everything perfect. 
they seemed like the ultimate, incredible, down-home filmmakers because they had hands on everything. And John Carpenter just seemed like a genius to me because he really knew so, so much about what he wanted from every single second of the film. We're so vested, we don't have time to really go, well, how did he get over there so fast? And why can he drive, right? So they throw it away in the dialogue when he's like, well, he's doing pretty well last night, Loomis says, right? But but it's like, that's how they cover their bases because everything else is working so well, we don't have time to fret about it. Do you remember the first time you saw Halloween? Yeah, honestly, I don't. I think I saw, I know I saw that first. I know I saw that before I saw any of his other movies. Everything else came later because I watched stuff out of order. It's interesting because, like, I tried to remember mm -hmm. when I would have seen it because I was a scared kid. So okay. it was not it was not something that was like on my radar, and you wouldn't and, have sought it out. No, because it just freaked me out. And then okay. I think what I do remember though is that watching it and kind of the revelation of the violence being less important than the suspense was like I became like the evangelist for mm. that, and just I just haven't stopped since. What about you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at, 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 with Josh on this, it's funny because, you know, there, I have very specific memories of seeing certain movies. Like I could talk about seeing, uh, you know, Space Hunter and uh, <laughs> Metal Rod, 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 Rod. <laughs> and, and I, I don't know exactly when I first saw Halloween, but I know it was around the time like my older cousins were hyping it up. It was around Halloween. It had to be early 80s, like 80, 81. And it was already on like the network television around Halloween. That had already started. It's Halloween, the night he came home, when the deepest fears are made real, when the darkest nightmares come true, when the most courageous soul cowers in the face of evil. First time on TV, a modern horror classic from John Carpenter, parental discretion advised. This film contains elements of shock and suspense. And now, Halloween, you won't be watching it alone. And I, again, I was too young to really understand it, but I like the mythos and the hype was there. And I just remember them being so excited because they knew that we shouldn't be watching this. I mean, they, they could be watching, but they knew that if my parents knew that they were going to have us watching this movie, my parents would have freaked out. So like they were reveling in the fact that like, ooh, tonight we're going to watch Halloween. And I don't remember if it was Halloween 2 was on or, or Halloween 2 was out yet, but they're distinctly remember like, we're going to watch Halloween and you're going to be so scared. I was terrified and exhilarated at the same time before I even laid eyes on it. And I remember that. And I remember it already being a thing of like, okay, Halloween night, we're showing Halloween. And a testament to the power that this movie had to kind of really just jump into that zeitgeist and that that culture had already been you know, almost like it arrived fully formed. Like it wasn't like it took like, you know, I think there's something like, you know, growing up like the Wizard of Oz would be on like every year and mm. before streaming and, and cable and all this, like you had to wait the entire year to see the Wizard of Oz, but you look forward to it because it was like an event. But that was a movie that came out in the 30s. And so that had decades to kind of build up to be this classic, whereas Halloween already, like, you know, a couple of years in, people at the networks were like, we got to put this on Halloween night. This will be great. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, the fact that that culture had already been formed, um, even to my mind, like it was all part of like the mix. And while I can't remember the exact first time I saw it, I can remember the feelings around mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And and that stuck with me for, for my whole life, for sure. Do you remember, Burr? I kind of vaguely, I think I have a more tangible memory than you guys, because in, in my neck of the woods, WGN was what Pix was to Pete on Long Island. And WGN had like a regional stronghold in Chicago. Nice. So if you were watching Terminator, it was probably on WGN. And later on, it would become the Fox affiliate that would air things on Saturday afternoon. And that's where I saw a lot of movies. Yeah. But WGN, they would always air it in the way they would air Jaws, which was on, on the 4th of July. They would have Jaws 1, 2, 3. And they would release it so that prime time Whoa. would be Jaws, right? From like 7 to like 9. And you'd yeah. get like the 9 o'clock news. And then they would air something for 30 minutes and then you'd get Jaws 2 at like Crazy. 10 o'clock and Crazy. that would go to midnight. And maybe if my folks were asleep, I could like catch most of Jaws 2 before midnight, maybe get to like the intro of part three. Next. Michael Audrey Myers shall be tried as an adult. 
for the murder of his sister, Judith Margaret Myers. You fooled them, have you, Mike? But not me. It's a holiday you'll remember forever. Halloween night is when people play tricks on each other. What about the boogeyman? Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. Seasons don't feel high. Nor do the wind of sun away. We can be like that. Jamie Lee Curtis. What's the boogeyman? Donald Pleasance. As a matter of fact, it was. In a film by John Carpenter. Oh, no. Halloween. Next. That's how I saw Halloween, where I would see one in prime time, you'd get the news, and two and three. And I remember it was around like, 88 when part four came out that they already had three to show yeah so be like hey on monday night we're airing halloween one and then tuesday night we're gonna have halloween two in a prime time halloween three what is this what <laughs> happened this is so weird <laughs> and then maybe they would re-air halloween on like sunday afternoon at like you know wow. from three to five or five to six those were always my memories and then to something you said earlier josh I was scared of it because, you know, Mm -hmm. it's the talk of like recess, right? Like you're supposed to be scared of Halloween, but then thinking, wait a second, there's not a lot of blood in this. This is, like you said, this is relatively bloodless. Uh, It it is more of a thriller. It is more suspenseful Mm -hmm. than what I had made it out to be, which again is a part of the magic of Halloween. Then realizing when I was able to see the actual VHS version, not the theatric, the TV version. TV version. There's not much here except for some language. Where's the scene that I assumed that they would have cut out? I feel like that's how I felt about Halloween. It took a while, but once I saw it, I was like, I get it. I understand now. Like, this is so different than a Sorority House Massacre or April Fool's Day. This is different than all of those other movies, but now I can see how it inspired it. So that's where your comment to uh, to your fellow classmates about horror being the bastard, uh, uh, Josh, like, it, it, in some ways, it makes sense because it's like you're grouping yeah. Halloween in that group picture with all of those others, not realizing that it's kind of on the side. It's different. Yep. And I, and I think that the, the primary reason for that is it requires your participation. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is the key component to like how this visual thing works. But I think also the strength of it. There's this trio. Like if you look at Texas Chainsaw and you look at Halloween and you look at Psycho. Most of the time, the most effective sequences, the things that people always talk about, you're not seeing what you're actually seeing. Almost all of it is in your head. Mm-hmm. So it's like the the hook scene in Texas Chainsaw, as effective as that is, people would swear that they saw it and they didn't, right? He lifts her up and she rests and we see the reaction shot, right? It's all implied. It's all implied. Part of the strength of that movie is that same mechanism is that it requires us to fill the gaps, right? So that amazing montage in Psycho, it's like it requires us to fill in the gaps. And the thing with Halloween is that Michael's mask is a blank slate. There's no expression on it at all. It requires us to project. He's literally standing there. If you took the music out, and Carpenter has said it right in his own recollections, that it's like the thing didn't work. They tested it. It didn't work. He added his score that he wrote in two and a half, three days because he was the cheapest musician he knew. And all of a sudden, it all worked. I had to do the music to Halloween in about three days. I I had to do the whole score so I could go in and perform it and get out. My dad had taught me uh, five, four time on on a set of bongos when I was young. So just to teach me some rhythms. They're not four four time, it's off one. And so I decided just to do that on a, as an octave on a piano. A part of the thing that's working is that the music is inviting us to project on that blank slate. It's a blank canvas. His face is a blank canvas. He's not sitting there snarling, and his face doesn't even look anything like, you know, Leatherface's awful mask, right? That thing is like has a scowl on it. There's no expression. There's literally no expression on Michael's face. And he's just standing there. His hands are not up. He doesn't have like a dagger in his hand. The thing that for me that kind of blew my mind where I would watch the thing with the sound off and I would just look at what was happening on screen and just looking at the composition, right? So the first thing is Carpenter is a dyed in the wool Howard Hawks fan and he's a huge Western fan. And so we're dealing in widescreen. So there's a lot of frame to fill. The irony is there's times where Michael is not at that frame and it is still like pregnant with tension. You are still totally freaked out 
because you're convinced that he's there. You're convinced that he's going to show up, but he's not there. But they've done such a good job by setting it up and showing where he is, and then he disappears, and then he comes back. You're actually being menaced by absence. You are getting freaked out by literally nothing, which on some level, the basic tenet of fear, right, is you go into the house, it's too quiet, you start projecting and thinking about what's there in the shadows. It's what we all do as human beings. And so the the thing that I find so fascinating is that once you start peeling the layers back, there's like primal stuff that's at work here. And it's like literally his third movie. I'm certainly not the expert. Like, I'm just trying to look at what I can observe, and I'm not projecting a whole lot of intent outside of, I've seen Assault on Precinct 13, so I know what this guy can do. I know what he's capable of. So this didn't come out of nowhere. So there's a skill here. There's an art and a craft to this. And we know that he was a Suspiria fan. You can run from Suspiria. You can hide from Suspiria. Who's there? Who's there? But you cannot escape Suspiria. Once you've seen Suspiria, you will never again feel safe in the dark. Rated R, under 17, not admitted without parents. A lot of Argento's work in that movie is, you know, there's times where people are being menaced by, you can't even see it. You can't even see what this beautiful young woman's being menaced by. But the tension that all of that creates and kind of what they built, it requires you to be involved. And I think that is the big difference is that most of this other stuff, we're just watching. We're not super involved in. And I think part of the design of Halloween is that it it pulls you in and seduces you by forcing you to participate. So that was like one of the big big things that for me made it like oh there is an art and craft they're taking every opportunity visually so that was one of the biggest things for me